This is the second part of our lecture on symbioses. Our second symbiosis story is Vespophily. Apparently Google also doesn't consider this a word. It's definitely a word. Um, I heard it in an ecology class where we were talking about trillium because trillium is pollinated by wasps. So you might re recognize this root word philly where we were talking about different types of pollination syndromes. So philly, we're thinking pollination. And vesp, think about a vespa, that means wasp. So wasp pollination. A fig is an enclosed inflorescence called a syconium. And we talked about this on our field trip where we walked around in the forest behind um, CR. So here we are looking at a fig and a syconium. So we have this enclosed inflorescence. This is made up from many florets from an inflorescence. And all of those florets develop within this structure. So if you think about how pollination works, you want to get your pollen to flowers that are not you, right? So you want to cross pollinate with something else to maintain, to maintain genetic variety within your population. So we have a bunch of enclosed florets. They're gonna produce pollen and they're gonna produce stigmas and the pollen's gonna get on those stigmas and it's gonna self pollinate. And eventually we might get some kind of inbreeding depression um, or um, less genetic um, viability because we have less variety. So how are they going to overcome this condition? Ooh, this is just a really cool picture of a fig inflorescence. So here we can see the individual little florets. I'm imagining this is probably the calyx here that's surrounding them, and then they wouldn't have petals or sepals. You can see this round structure, that's the ovary. On some of these, you might be able to see a style and stigma perhaps sticking out. These figs are pollinated by fig wasps, which are small parasitic wasps, parasitic wasps, with elongated heads for squeezing through the osteal. So you can sometimes um, look at an organism and kind of try to figure out what it does by its shape. So kind of paying attention to those characteristics. So they have this elongated flat head for squeezing through the osteal of the fig. Fig wasps that are pollinators will also have a relatively short um, ovipositor, whereas there are other types of fig wasps that will parasitize figs strictly without pollinating and they do that from the outside they have a very long ovipositor and you'll see pictures of fig wasps but they're not the pollinating fig wasp because their ovipositor is like this long and they use it to jab through the outside of the fig and um, parasitize it from the outside without ever entering so just a little bit of how you can recognize these different types of wasps so a pregnant female fig wasp will squeeze through that osteal. And often in the process, her wings are gonna get ripped off. Um, her abdomen might get a little bit squished. Um, she might sustain some life-threatening injuries as she squeezes through this osteal. It is not really big enough for her to get in, but it is just big enough so that she can probably get in. And multiple female fig wasps might end up in the same syconium. Once she's inside the fig, she will use her ovipositor to deposit eggs into the ovaries of the flowers. So that ovipositor is going to be put into the style, down into the ovary, where she will then lay her egg. And you can see here, this egg has developed into a wasp larva inside of that ovary wall. And this is normally where the fruit would be produced. And there would be nutrients in there for that growing embryo, right? Um, so this production of a wasp larvae is not going to allow for the production of a fig seed. Instead of having our fruit be full of seeds, our fruit will be full of wasp. There will be three types of florets within a syconium. And it depends on the species of fig because some figs will be all male or all female. But in the syconiums we're talking about, there are male florets, and you can recognize these anther structures. And there'll be two different types of female florets. About half of them will have a short style, 
and the other half will have this longer style. So we can compare those style lengths, and this isn't to scale, to the length of the ovipositor. So that ovipositor, if it isn't long enough, will only get about halfway down the style and try to lay an egg there, won't be able to, right? Because it's still within the style. It needs to lay the egg inside the ovary. So once this female fig wasp is all done, long styled florets are going to turn into seeds and produce more figs. Short styled florets are going to turn into wasps and produce more wasps. Of the florets that become wasps, the male wasps are born first and they're born flightless and blind. They're born in a very high CO2 content environment because that syconium is closed. So there's tons of cellular respiration happening within the florets as well as because of these developing wasps. So CO2 concentration builds up and then that becomes a trigger for the emergence of these male wasps. So they walk around on all the little florets and they go impregnate all of their sisters who are still within the ovary. Then they tunnel a hole in the side of the syconium and a bunch of oxygen rushes in and those male wasps die. Their whole life as a male wasp is to emerge, impregnate their sisters and make a hole and die. But that's essential to this whole cycle, right? So then our female fig wasps are triggered to emerge when the oxygen content inside that uh, syconium increases. So the female fig wasps come out. And when they do, it is the time for the male florets inside the syconium to be flowering. So they'll be producing pollen. And the female fig wasps go around and collect pollen from these male florets. And this is what this video is. I'll link it in the description. It's amazing to watch. They look very purposeful as they do this. They walk around all the male florets, they grab pollen, and they put it in little pouches on their body. These female fig wasps are already pregnant. So they wake up pregnant, born pregnant, and then go out through that tunnel that their brothers made. And they go find another fig to lay their babies inside. So this whole life cycle is incredibly time dependent on the flowering of the fig, both the female and male phase of those fig florets, as well as the kind of timing for gestation for the fig wasps. So each of these female fig wasps is going to go find another fig, hopefully for her, and then repeat that same process that her mother went through. Some types of figs that are grown for human consumption have figs that ripen without pollination. It's also possible to trick plants into ripening figs without wasps by spraying them with plant hormones. So this is something that we do a lot for agricultural purposes. If we're trying to, like, we want to grow tomatoes and we want to ship those tomatoes, um, we want them to be ripe, but we can't pick them ripe and ship them or they're all squish on top of each other when we try to pile them into these large boxes. So we pick them green and put them into these boxes and ship them and then we spray them with this hormone called ethylene and that causes them to ripen. Um, I think it's ethylene, but maybe don't quote me on that. I forget, it's been a while since I taught about plant hormones. Um, so this is kind of a similar thing that we can do with figs is provide them a hormone that causes them to ripen so that people aren't eating a bunch of um, wasp parts or so that we don't have to rely on wasps being around in that particular environment to get pollination. Because even when figs are grown the old fashioned way with wasps, the wasp is long gone by the time the fig crosses your lips. Figs produce a chemical called physin that breaks down the wasp bodies. Physin is so effective at breaking down or digesting animal proteins that natives of Central America eat fig sap to treat intestinal worm infections. Pretty fun. This is another video that I'll have to put a link to in the description. You know that I love David Attenborough, and in this particular video, um, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a sloth right here, and this sloth is climbing down a tree to go poop on the ground. And David Attenborough is just sitting there. He could be a predator, and that sloth probably wouldn't see him, wouldn't smell him, and even if it did, it would be too late for it to escape because it's so slow. So it goes down there and it poops, and he's just watching it, and he looks at it and he goes, boo! 
and it so slowly turns its head to look at him. And you wonder, why on earth is this thing coming to poop on the ground? And how can it possibly survive? So there's a complicated story here, and maybe we understand it, maybe we don't. We have some ideas about it. You can see this sloth on the left, and its fur has all this green algae in it. So that's gonna be important, that green coloration. And we'll also maybe have some moths involved in this story. So a little bit about sloths first. Sloths spend most of their time up in the canopy and they have these sort of long toes with long claws on them that they can wrap around tree branches and just sort of hang so that they don't have to spend or expend a bunch of energy. They also move around very slowly, very slow metabolism. Everything that a sloth does, it's like the one thing we know about sloths, they're slow. So they go around very slowly in the upper canopy, chomping on leaves. And their main food source are these leaves that they can't really digest. There's not really a lot of nutritive content to them. And some of them have some toxins that are actually bad for the sloths. So sloths are half blind, half deaf, and super slow because they don't really have the energy to move quickly. And now they have lost probably the physical capacity to do so. So this is complicated. How do sloths even survive this way? They were looking at sloth stomach contents to try to figure out this mystery. And they were finding a lot more fats than they would normally find. There are more fats, more proteins than would be produced in these leaves that they were eating but those fats and proteins, and also inside their stomach contents, they found green algae. Green algae that weren't on the leaves that they were eating, but that were found inside of their fur. So sloth hairs are these like hollow tubes. If you've ever seen polar bears at the zoo where it's warm, like in warmer places, sometimes those polar bears will be a little bit green because they also have these hollow tube hairs. Um, and then algae can grow inside of those tubes. So algae, are one of our members of this symbiosis here. Sloths are another one. The algae are growing inside the hairs of those sloths, making these kind of dense mats of algae. It gives them a little bit of camouflage. Um, I don't know if there's been any studies done on whether that helps them or not, but it makes them at least a little bit more green and blending into their leafy canopy background. But the sloths are apparently eating that algae, kind of scraping it off their own fur and eating it and getting protein and fats. So that's one part of the relationship. This still doesn't explain why once a week, these sloths will go from the upper canopy down to the forest floor, which is the place where they are most likely to die, um, usually due to some large predator like a jaguar um, that's going to kill them. They have no reason to do this physiologically because you can poop from the sky and it's just gonna fall down, maybe on a jaguar and have, you know, like a nice moment thinking about that. So the fact that they go down to the ground once a week, every week, and risk their lives to take a really slow poop is very strange, but they do it and they go poop in the same spot. So why would they do this? People were watching them and they noticed that this moth species, which brings in our third candidate over here for our symbiosis, were present on the sloth fur. So these particular moths live on the sloths as adults. And um, that life is not necessarily very long, but it is um, so that they can then reproduce. So the adult form of this moth is going to reproduce on the sloth. That is its mating ground. So they'll reproduce on the sloth. Um, they mate there, but then they need to lay their eggs in poop because that's what their larvae eat. So every time the sloth goes down to poop, the moths fly off of that sloth and go lay their eggs in the poop, and then they can get back onto the sloth again, or they die. So as the moths live on the sloth, they're also defecating and potentially contributing with their dead bodies to the nutrients that these algae need to survive. So the algae are getting nutrients from the sloth poop and dead bodies. And the sloth is getting nutrients 
from the algae. And the moth is getting a place to reproduce. So that sloth revisiting that same pile of poop allows for it to get this continual new source of moths. So this is this weird tripartite symbiosis with these three components and this very complicated situation for the sloth where maybe it is better for it to risk its life once a week instead of just letting it fly from the sky to have algae as a food source, potentially. What a weird situation.